Assalamu alaikum. Dear learners, I hope you are fine and have understood whatever we have learned up till now in the course of instrumentation and measurements. In the previous lecture, we discussed the types of errors that may be induced into our instrumentation system and we studied that how we can reduce and additionally quantify some of those errors. In the previous lecture, I also mentioned that one proper way of removing errors induced into our system is calibration. So, in this lecture, the first part will be related to calibration. However, in the later part, I will discuss the last type of error that can be induced into any instrumentation system, which is called noise. So, let us start with the calibration first. What comes into your mind when you hear the word calibration? Calibration has several steps involved in it. The first step with which the calibration starts is when you compare the instrument with some standard instrument. For example, you might have done this if you are a bit skeptic about how things are going in the market. You might have asked the shopkeeper to weigh the two standard masses against each other just to check whether his weighing machine is working perfectly or not. What you could have done, you could have placed two half kg masses on one side and one kg mass on the other side. And if the weighing balance shows you the null reading, you would have been satisfied. Similarly, to check the effectiveness of any instrument that has been installed in an industrial environment for quite some time, it's a good idea to compare its output with some standard instrument. The need for this arises because of all these sources of errors that may have induced some kind of errors or may have changed the characteristics of the instrument in some way. So, to put it simply, you apply some input or range of input to the instrument and record its output. Then you apply the same range of input to a standard calibration instrument and record its output too. And then you compare these two outputs received from both instruments. If the instrument which you have installed in the factory floor shows some deviation, then it means that it needs calibration. However, if both outputs are similar or the deviation is acceptable, then it means the instrument can work for a bit longer. Therefore, the procedure of calibration is carried out for the whole range of inputs. It might be the case where the instrument is performing well for a certain portion of the range of inputs, but it might not be generating standard output for, for some other range of the input. Therefore, when you want to check any instrument for calibration, make sure you check the whole range of the input. If we talk about calibration instrument, that instrument must have an established accuracy. And as that instrument doesn't need to be operated in harsh environment and should only be kept in the lab environment in some controlled environment, therefore, ruggedness is out of the list of the requirement for this instrument. And you can well appreciate that if you remove this requirement, then it opens up a number of possibilities. We can have very good, very accurate sensitive equipment which we know will never be used in any harsh environment or out of calibration environment. Therefore, in practice, high accuracy null type instruments are commonly used as calibration instruments. And as human involvement is not an issue over here because you have to supervise the calibration process and you have to do the things on your own. So the requirement of operating null type instrument by humans is not an issue now. Depending on the type of the industry or the type of application where some instrument is being used, the calibration should be repeated at prescribed intervals because no matter how safely you are using any instrument, there are chances that its characteristics will change due to its mechanical wear, dust, fumes, changes in temperature and pressure, etc. However, the frequency of this calibration depends on the application and should be analyzed very carefully because when you are going to check the calibration of any instrument, this means that you have to remove that instrument from the process or in some serious cases, you might have to stop the whole process 
to check the calibration of the instruments involved. Therefore, it is not something that you can easily do or you can do it on daily basis or even weekly basis. Once again, depending on the industry or the application where you are considering this calibration problem, you need to define the course of actions that must be taken for calibrating an equipment. Because as I've already said, that you have to remove the instrument from the process or in some worst cases, you have to stop the whole process itself. This might cause you in terms of loss in production and wastage of valuable worker time. Normally, a recalibration may involve some of the tasks like simply adjustment of dials to remove the output bias or you may have to redraw the output scale if you can't adjust the dials or if the instrument is part of some automatic control system, then you might have to adjust the gains or different parameters involved in that system. And in the extreme cases, you might have to remove the instrument and get it prepared from the lab established inside the industry, or you might have to send it out somewhere, or even in worst cases, you might have to scrap that instrument and install a new one. So if you have established some calibration frequency, it doesn't mean that you have done your job. You must review that calibration frequency because this calibration frequency might needs an adjustment depending on the age of the instrument and also the environment where that instrument is being used. In fortunate cases, the environment might change beneficially where the calibration frequency might be reduced and can also change adversely where you might need to increase the calibration frequency. Please note one thing that you should keep this thing in mind that whatever instrument is being used for calibration procedures must never be used for any other purpose. Because if you are going to use that calibration instrument for any other purpose, then the accuracy and integrity of that instrument may be compromised. Therefore, calibration equipment must never be considered as a spare part or a spare instrument and must never be replaced even for a tiny amount of time for any instrument that is being used in the factory floor. Moreover, depending on the size of the factory or the industrial setup, a calibration facility must be established inside the industrial setup and its environment must be controlled effectively so that whenever there is a need for calibration, the first lab or the first facility any instrument must visit should be inside the industrial premises. This flow graph shows the levels that are used for establishing calibration standards. At the bottom, there are process instruments or the instruments that are used on the factory floor. If they need some kind of adjustment or calibration, they must be compared with the working standards which have been established by the company through their calibration laboratory. This calibration laboratory, which is operating inside any industry, must be in constant contact with the standard laboratories around the country. These standard laboratories are accredited laboratories from the national level organization of any country. So, for any country, a national standard organization will define the standards that will be followed by standard laboratories and if any industry needs any kind of help for calibration or about any standard, the standards laboratory must be contacted. In the UK, the United Kingdom Accreditation Service or UCAS represents the sole national accreditation body that is recognized by the British government. It was established in 1995 through a merger of National Measurement Accreditation Service and National Accreditation Council for Certification Bodies. The National Measurement Accreditation Service was itself a result of a merger in 1985 of National Testing Laboratory Accreditation Scheme that was established in 1981 and British Calibration Service that was formed in 1966. So if you have anything or if you want any type of standard or equipment to be calibrated or to be defined, this is the accreditation service that must be contacted. There are various standard laboratories that have been certified from UCAS and they can help you in getting your instruments calibrated. As far as US is concerned, National Institute of Standards and Technology, commonly known as NIST, is the oldest 
physical science laboratory that maintains or have the responsibility of maintaining standards all around the industries present in the United States. It was founded in 1901 and is now part of U.S. Department of Commerce. The main aim behind establishing this institute was to lift U.S. industrial setup and bring it at a comparable level with United Kingdom, Germany, and other economic rivals. As far as Pakistan is concerned, National Physical and Standard Laboratories was established in 1974 under a project of PCSIR. It started functioning in 1983 at its headquarters under PCSIR at Islamabad. It is the only National Metrology Institute of Pakistan that is functioning in a proper manner and rendering services related to calibration and testing of industrial equipment. In order to maintain the international traceability and compatibility, this institute regularly participates in inter-laboratory comparisons or proficiency testing that is conducted within the member countries of Asia-Pacific Metrology Program. This consortium ensures that all the industrial standards that are being followed in the Asia-Pacific region complies with each other. Depending on the country to which you belong, you can find easily that which is the national center or the national organization for maintaining the standards in your region. So if you have any problem regarding calibration or standardization of any industrial equipment, this is the center which you should contact. Just to give you an idea that how calibration can be done with industrial setup, we are going to go through an example of gauge blocks. Gauge blocks are also known as Johansson gauges, slip gauges, or Joe blocks. These blocks are in fact used to generate or produce precision length and all the equipments that are used to measure length can be calibrated using gauge blocks or they can be compared with the length generated by the gauge block to know that if the instrument is working perfectly or not. A single gauge block is nothing but a metal or a ceramic block that has been so precisely grounded and lapped that if gauge blocks are brought together, their molecules will attract each other and adhesive force will exist between them so that they will stick with each other. So using different gauge blocks from a set of blocks you can generate a range of standard lengths and then you can use any length measuring equipment to measure that length. If the length generated by the gauge block is equal to what the instrument is giving, then it means the instrument is working perfectly. But if the instrument is giving you something else, then this means the instrument needs some kind of calibration. Over here, I have shown you an example of gauge blocks. You can find many other type of gauge blocks in the market. By the gauge blocks shown over here, you can generate any length ranging from 0 to around 300 millimeters up to four decimal places. So choosing the right combination, you can generate any length, for example, 3.7898. And then you can use a vernier caliper or a micrometer to measure this length. However, if the screw gauge is giving you a different length, then this means that the instrument needs some kind of calibration or it has some error in it. This flow graph shows the levels that can be achieved using standard gauge block. At the lowest level, you have a shop floor micrometer screw gauge that has an accuracy of 1 in 10 raised to power 4. This means that if you divide a meter in 10,000 parts, then the micrometer which is commonly used on the factory floor may read one part inaccurately. For example, if a certain length is of 3.7728, then the micrometer can read this length as 3.7727 or 3.7729. A normal standard gauge has an accuracy of 1 in 10 raised to power 5. That is, if you divide the whole meter, into 0.1 million parts, then a standard gauge block might show an inaccuracy of one part. These standard gauges are in turn calibrated using reference grade gauge blocks. And these reference grade gauge blocks have an inaccuracy of one in 10 raised to power six. Moreover, spectrum lamps are used to accurately machine and to test the reference grade gauge blocks. And even the spectral lamp 
is calibrated using iodine stabilized helium neon laser that has an inaccuracy of 1 in 10 raised to power 9 units. So by seeing this graph, you might have guessed by now that to calibrate any instrument, you need an instrument of even higher accuracy. You cannot calibrate a micrometer using another micrometer. You need some kind of equipment that has higher accuracy than the micrometer itself. It is recommended to view a referenced video to see the working of gauge blocks. In this video, the operator shows that how you can use a gauge block to produce any standard length and then use a micrometer to measure that length.